Get excited, America, because Dunkin' Go-To's are here. Double deals on breakfast sandwiches made for go-getters. Why two sandwiches? Because sometimes your appetite is like your playlist. After one sandwich is over, you just want to hit next and enjoy another. So come into Dunkin' Donuts now and get two egg and cheese wake-up wrap sandwiches for $2, two egg and cheese English muffins for $3, or two bacon egg and cheese croissants for $5. America runs on Dunkin'. Participation may vary. Limited time offer. Restrictions apply. Love Talk. Radio. Well, hey, everybody. It's Tuesday. I know that everybody thought I was going to be on radio yesterday. Even I thought I was going to be on radio yesterday. And then the good, fine doctor says to me, you have what we call acute bronchitis. Yeah, that's not cute. And no, I'm not happy. Why? Because I'm going to Vegas, as we all know, to the NAB convention. And this is not going to make life very easy. So here I am, but I'm actually here. I'm showing up. Very big guest today. Very excited. Very honored. Very humbled. And I don't even know how many words I can use to describe this. That's how excited I am. But before we get him to come on the line, let's go ahead and cover a really super quick, fast, like 60 seconds worth of news as it relates to me. Reminder to everybody, Art is Alive Film Festival, my film festival, is coming up on regular submission date, April 14th, which is... I have Alzheimer's and I can't remember right now, but it's this weekend sometime. The fee goes up from 30 to $35. So please, please, please don't forget to submit. Um, filmfreeway.com, Art is Alive Film Festival is the name. <clears throat> Excuse me. I believe we're at the $30 mark for regular submissions. That's regular as in shorts, features, web series. We also take youth films for the bargain price of $10, and I'm doing screenplays. Why? Because I'm a writer, and that's $10. So don't forget about that. Reminder to everybody about Love's Two-Way Mirror, which is my film. Yes, I'm still casting. Yes, I know I should stop casting, but I can't help myself. I need a few more people. So that means two in L.A., two in New York City, and two in Wisconsin. If you have any interested parties, two ways to reach me, off my social media, or you you can email me directly at cin4251 at gmail.com. Um, on a side note, before we start the interview, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everybody that reached out. Um, like I said, it's just bronchitis. It hopefully will go away. Um, if you are in Las Vegas, I'm going to be there starting tonight, going through the convention, which is the 11th and 12th. It's the NAB convention, National Association of Broadcasters, which I am, but just tons of things when it comes to filmmakers, broadcasting, TV producers, camera equipment. It's just you name it. Tons of fun. And who doesn't want to hang out with me for like two days, right? Actually, I don't want to hang out with me. I don't even feel good. So instead of listening to me talk, I'm sure you all want to listen to Mark talk. So let's get him on the line and start asking him some questions. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Uh, well, I um, I have bronchitis. <laughs> so I'm excited. Oh you're like my one – I'm you're like the one show of the week. I'm like – this is the only show I'm doing this week, and it's you, and I'm petrified because I'm, like, oh. on my knee, like, I'm not worthy. It's Mark, and he's on my show. What? This is so awesome. Oh, <laughs> no, off that bended knee. No, not at all. Oh, um, oh my God. No, I'm actually Are you kidding just me? You... Um, nice to chat. Oh, this is good, and I'm glad, because I have tons and tons of questions. I'm a journalist myself. I know a lot about you. I've been watching you for, like, 20 years. That says how old I am. Yes, I'm almost 50 years uh. old. So... I've been watching you for a long time, um, so there's a oh, lot to well, talk about. That's, so that's a, yeah, that's either a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know how. Depending well, on how it's we actually a good thing. Just for today, <laughs> place, it's a good thing. Okay. <laughs> it's a tremendously good thing because yeah. I remember I remember oh. the ET days and then I remember all these different interviews that I've seen of you and I've watched you and I've watched your style and I've watched you yeah. grow and I've watched you change and that's a big deal in this industry. Uh-huh. Change is a big deal. Um, so yeah. I want to start off by asking a very simple question because I just saw very recently um, you did a concert, the Greg Kood concert for the arts. I want to talk about that because yeah. my favorite oh, yeah. crush as a, uh, as a teenager, I was totally all over Rick Springfield. And I'm like, oh, my God, I heard you were yeah. with Rick Springfield. And I'm like, bonus. So talk to us about that. <laughs> what was that like? And how did you get involved in that? Well, the Greg Kood's concert for the arts is a, a, a wonderful, wonderful fundraiser that keeps – um, you know, it's just it's a local Santa Monica Malibu High School, a public high school uh, fundraiser to help keep arts in the school, not just music, but theater and um, art classes and things like that. You know, cuts uh, the cuts have gone deep when it comes to those kind of programs in our public schools. So, I, gosh, I think I've been involved now well over a decade with this fundraiser. It used to be called Artists for the Arts, and everybody from David Crosby to, gosh, um, 
the the gals from Heart came and performed. Um, we've had so many, and it's all high school students that support these main, sometimes Grammy winning artists, and back them up, whether it's the choir or it's the jazz band or orchestra or whatnot. Um, and um, you know, I've I've emceed it, and I've always music has always been a big part of my life. So Rick Springfield came on my show a couple of times on Home and Family, and. Um, yeah, it just so turns out that one of his uh, singers on his new album is a dear, dear friend of mine of over 20 years, and uh, they were able to to get him to come on and perform. And he came on and performed, you know, the, his main big songs. You know, he did, I think he did five or six of them. He's just a warm, friendly. Like you would think, he would have some sort of ego about him. He's not. He is one of the most gracious people you'll ever meet. Oh, nice. See, that's so nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And I like that. I like that you yeah. support that. In fact, I, I, because I'm a journalist, I stalked you a little bit in a good way, so I'll be using some of your quotes during this interview. <laughs> like, for instance, Mark has said, and you've referred to this on a, on a couple of different occasions, you've talked about how art can be so very therapeutic. So talk to me a little bit about um, using art within your own life, because I know you, we'll get into the photography thing, but... How is art therapeutic yeah. to you? And, and second of all, what about those that are listening in that have no concept or haven't ca- kind of tapped into their creative side? What would you tell them? You know, it's really interesting because it, that, the answer to that question has evolved now that I've got children because I see wow. how, you know, both of my, both of my boys – um, 14 and 16, um, have really turned to music. Now, I was the jock in school. I played football, scholarship, college, the whole bit. And neither one of them are really, I mean, my oldest one is a, he's a very good golfer. But outside of that, um, you know, they've really turned to music as a form of expression. And when I sit and watch them, it, it's music and particularly has been proven to show, you know, it keeps kids in school. It helps them with math. It helps them with a variety of of developmental things that come along. I have, on the other side, have been more of a visual artist, so I'm more of in the photography mm-hmm. or Photoshop kind of thing. And that is um, um, such a, you know, there's no, for me, there's nothing more, um, I think, peaceful and tranquil than, than um, sitting, getting up on a Saturday or Sunday morning with a cup of coffee and sitting with Photoshop and retouching images or creating something in the digital, in the digital world. Um, and then, Another step further is Julie, my wife, her mom is, uh, she's a doctor. Uh, she taught teach, she taught art for 40 years back East and was, some um, uh, granted by Disney teacher of the year awards. So she won a national award several years back because of her passion and love for art. Um, she does, she works in all different media. She's from charcoal to pencil to paints to acrylics. And she does some of the most realistic portraits and she, um, is such a wonderful person. Like I think with art, not only comes a way to express yourself, but also to learn acceptance and sit back and understand that, that somebody who may be creating a piece of art, whether it's music or whether it's something, you know, a drawing or whatever, says something about mm-hmm. themselves or what they're going through, their process. And for my kids, you know, um, for them, it's the music they write, um, I would talk with Ginger, my, my mother-in-law, and she would sometimes have some really troubled youth that got kicked out of school a couple of times and be sent to her art class, and she would put a pen or you know a pencil in their hand and let them draw, and she could interpret so much of their inner struggles just by what they would put on the paper. So um, there's so much that comes from art that we just kind of go, ah, it's scribbles, and it's not. It really isn't. Um, Another thing that I'd like to add to that that I think is really, really important, too, is, you know, because of of Home and Family, the show that I work on, we do a lot of DIYs. And I'm very handy when it comes to building things. And I taught my kids how to use power tools and all that. And there's the same process Mm -hmm. that happens over and over again, whether you're building a little birdhouse or you're building the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, it all starts off with an idea. And that idea starts in our mind. It is then translated and transformed and takes shape and reinvented over and over again until we decide to put it down on paper. And then it moves to that next stage of like, okay, the what ifs and the imagination that is needed for any kind of art is now put it onto a piece of paper or blueprint or whatnot. And then it begins to evolve from there into something that is solid and concrete, like a massive, you know, steel structure or a birdhouse. It doesn't matter. It's still that sort of, 
from our imagination, what we can see in our mind and how we can take that image and that, and that idea and translating it into the real world. Isn't that an amazing answer, folks? Oh, my God, I could sit and listen to that whole philosophy <laughs> for a day. I'm like, that's a, well, uh, and the yeah. sad part is, is we, we talk a lot about, and, and this happens in the schools a lot here because I'm primarily based in Wisconsin, but I see it in New York. I see it all over the place. There's this, this I think a lot of kids are desperate for having art in the school and keeping it in there, but unfortunately it seems to be a dying sort of entity, and, and I, I keep trying to do things and, and build things up and do this stuff. It's hard to keep the art alive. I mean, my, I have a whole film festival dedicated to this, but I'm like, that doesn't really help the schools, you know? So we need to promote the art in the school no. kids, people that are listening yeah. in. Huge I, on that. One of the, yeah, and one of, the, one of the places it can start is at home. And, and you know, I really have come to know how important parent involvement is in their kids' education. And it starts at a young age because I I used to, I had that, that crayon box that had the 96 different what colors in it with the sharpener in the back. And I used to love to color mm-hmm. and use it. Now everything is digital and our kids are losing out on that sort of process of creating and that, that visual world. Um, Yes, they can do things differently now than we did back in the day. But again, it's like All right. really limiting how much of that visual stimulation they have and that passive sort of um, intake and move it into something that. I gotcha. Oh, no. Hello? Don't tell me that we lost him. I think we did. Oh. Well, that's great. <laughs> Well, that's not always a positive sign when you have your guests on for like the first four minutes and he disappears. Well, well, hopefully hopefully he'll be calling right back in and we'll get an opportunity to continue talking to him. For those of you that weren't listening in a couple of minutes ago, we were actually talking about keeping the art alive in schools as far as what a huge, huge obligation and responsibility I think a lot of us have. Um, oh, he's back, so let's move on. Yep. Did you lose me or did I lose you? I'm driving up to 405 in Los Angeles, and I might drop ah. one more time. It's been so difficult. Uh-oh. I will call okay, you we're right crossing back. Fingers. My deepest Okay, apologies. no, that's perfect. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, yeah. that's okay. Um, uh, and speaking of your children, because I didn't want to get away from this, because I noticed that he hasn't mentioned her yet. Oh, my God. If you ever go on his Instagram, little Parker Rose, I'm like, oh, my God, this is the cutest <laughs> baby ever. And I have my beautiful children myself, but I'm like, oh, my God, you could eat that child up. So having a girl <laughs> is obviously different than having yeah. a boy. And, of course, Mark gushes about this child. Make no mistake. Oh, my God. He's constantly posting about this baby all the time. And it's just adorable. It's like, oh, my God. Um, and, again, another quote yeah. you had, which was, Dad's, Dads should fully embrace the role of being dad. So talk to me a little bit about what it's like to be dad to Parker, because she's young and little, and you have a huge schedule. So how does yeah. all of that work? Well, I get, you know, I'm a dad again after all these years. You know, my, my uh, right. from my previous marriage, I have a 14- and a 16-year-old, and now I have a little almost nine-month-old. And with right. that comes, you know, the sort of the vision that you can have and see what, what battles should be fought, which ones you go, they'll get through this. This is just all part of the development process. But no, I think there's, I think um, there are too many times, gosh, I hope I don't lose you in this one part, but there's too many times that we, I feel, I believe that as society, we let men off the hook. Whether they just are like, oh, I can't even let the kids home this weekend and with the kids because I don't know, they'll start, you know, he won't know what to feed them. And, and the guys just kind of go, yeah, yeah, you know, and, we, there's such low expectations, I believe, for, for dads, this is generally speaking, that we need to be held more accountable um, because right. we are very valuable in that, in that scheme. It's not good cop, bad cop. Um, it is simply, you know, and not just go out and throw, show them how to throw a football or baseball or golf club or whatever. It's really being there to show, be a moral compass, I think, for children. Mm-hmm. Um like learning how to speak with them, you know, using active listening skills and all of these things that are so, so important um, in, in an early child's development. You know, things that I'm learning now that I wish I'd do with my other kids that I'd screw up so much. Oh, right. But, uh, <laughs> you know, oh my gosh. it's how we, I, yeah, it's how we speak to them. And, you know, it's all like, like, for example, with Parker, she's so young right now, when she gets upset, it's like, okay, she can't speak. So she's trying to communicate. Right. So it's our job to decode this. So why is she crying? Oh, well, she's either hungry, she's either cold or she's warm, or she's tired, or she's got a dirty diaper. There's just a few things there that need to be processed. And then you just try to 
figure out what's going on. Oh, she's teething, so that could be the next thing. Um, but as they get older, you have to really watch and pay attention to what they're covering. Are they upset about something? Um, it's not about their words necessarily. Maybe, you know, like uh, one of one of my my oldest boy was having these uh, things called absent seizures his entire life, and I had no idea because they come and go so quickly. They're not full-on seizures, um, and, but they're more like he's daydreaming. But, it'll, it, but for like four or five seconds, that time won't exist for him. And I felt horrible because I didn't I didn't pick up on this, but we have to really watch as our children develop and watch for the issues. And it's not just a mom's job, you know. It's it's a father's job too. And I was I'm a single parent, so I felt horrible when this was happening, and I didn't pick up on it until like two years ago. Wow, and that's and it's so ironic that you mentioned that. In fact, because up until about six months or nine months ago, my son was a seizure patient for over three and a half years, and it was scary. It's frightening yeah. and, and it's debilitating. You know, depending on what type of seizures they have, yeah. it was it was it was crazy awful. And people in our industry, I think it's hard. It's hard to be in entertainment and try to have you know needs with your children. People don't always understand that. You know, there's expectations and obligations, and you know, family's always first. And it's it's a tough juggling act. I will tell you. And by the way, his wife, Julie, not only is she an author, like myself, but she's breathtaking. Oh, my God, you're like Ken and Barbie. I'm like, <laughs> look at them. They're the perfect family with a cute little baby. Okay, so we have to talk about your wife, and we have to talk about their books. Or more importantly, Julie, you can come on my show anytime you want. I'm big on promoting authors. Huge on that. Huge deal for me. Um, so tell us a bit about Julie. Tell us uh, a bit about how... Um, sure. Obviously, she's not a journalist, I don't think, right? Just an author, not a journalist. There is a distinction, yeah. so, believe it or not. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 there is. And she is um, she's a, an amazing artist. Um, what's bigger than that skill set is really her, her heart for philanthropic things. You know, she um, people might not know Julie, but they may know um, her dog or our dog, Norbert who is, right. has about 2 million followers, and he's the cutest little thing. And that's how, actually, he was our little Cupid, because Julie and I had a guest on my show talking about these children's books and what Norbert was, you know, um, how he was instrumental in this. And they would, her and her mom would go around to visit schools and visit retirement homes and things like that and share a story of, of, it doesn't matter how small we are, we can do, we can make big changes in the world. And that was kind of their message of spreading of happiness and hope and high fives. Um, but mm-hmm. she really is, she's absolutely wonderful. And as soon as I met her, as soon as actually I shook her hand, I knew. Um, and then, um, like every guy, I just completely ignored those impulses and just <laughs> shied away from her. And then she, um, after the show, she had emailed me because we have a, uh, we share promotional pictures from that day with our cast and with those who, who come in our guests and she was able to retrieve my email from that list and she asked me to dinner and it's all history from there. Oh, what a nice little isn't that sweet? It's just it what's so neat yeah. about this story is is that you're a recognizable person who has a very normal family, so to speak. I know that, that sounds strange to people because I'm like being normal is hard. It's tough to do when you work in an industry where there's a lot of <laughs> abnormal going on. And I know you get what I'm talking about. It's like a little whack. Yeah. It's a little crazy. Yeah. But it, it's very refreshing to hear that. And uh, uh, Okay, so I'm going to love this statistic. I read this statistic when I interviewed. Have you, ever, have you done Joanna Cassidy? I interviewed her not so long ago, and I loved her. Mm. She's lovely. Oh, no. Lovely actress. Oh. Um, and I read her these statistics. Now, they weren't the same statistics you have, but she was floored. So listen to this, folks. Get this. You have been named one of Hollywood's sexiest men by People Magazine. Now, get this. He's number 29,908 on the top celebrity crushes of all time. And he's number 18,587 on the most man crushed on celebrity guy. Wow. How do you get that? I mean, I want to know how to get to that list, period. I'm not even close to that list. I'm like, how? I mean, seriously, I'm not going to lie. I mean, you're in great shape. Not only does he look good, he looks good on camera, he looks good off camera, and he's in shape. Because, like, I just started going to the gym, so explain this to me, okay? Everyone at the gym is thin, and they're all pretty. So I'm asking myself, why are you at the gym? Because you don't need the gym. Fat person over here, I need the gym, okay? Unhappy fitness person needs the gym. So explain this to us, Mark. Why do you people need the gym? Because you all look perfect. I mean, am I wrong? Seriously. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> you're so funny. Um, 
You know what? I, I I can only talk about myself because as soon as you bring this subject matter up, people get very defensive. You know, you you you, right. you, you I don't I don't want to get preachy. I don't want to get up on a pulpit and start pounding my fist and saying, "Hey," but I'll just say sure. this this much is, and I'm I'm I clearly have my vices. You know, I'm. Um, I have, you know, I'm a chip king, you know, I love having the little, like a little pop chips here or something there. I try to make healthier choices when I do eat processed food, but that's what it comes down to. You know, I grew up in Iowa, in Dubuque, and we had a lot of farm to table, or in this case, garden to table sort of foods. And my parents were both farmers and I spent the summers working on the farm and we took cows right from the uh, milk, right from the cows and put it in the fridge and we poured over our cereal in the morning. Everything was unprocessed and I'm trying to go back. I have been trying to go back to that and put my kids on that as well. Um, I'm very aware mm-hmm. of food choices now and have been, but, but back to the fitness thing, um, I've always been, you know, I played football. I've always been somewhat active, right. but as I've gotten older, I've, I've really learned to kind of take care of myself more of a, um, a fit level and making sure my markers are all good. When I go to the fit, get my physical and things like that, I've t- typically I have high, cholesterol in my family so I keep an eye on it um but I mm-hmm. never go to the gym I I uh, um it's just living in Los Angeles it's difficult to get anywhere so I oh, have right. put it I basically converted my garage into a like a little a garage a workshop um my boys rehearse their music there I have a little photo studio and it's my gym. It's all like I just convert things. Everything's tucked away. And then when we decide to use it to take pictures, we, you know, I have backdrops and stuff or the boys get their rehearsal stuff there. And I just literally this morning, um, uh, I'm a big sort of like, there's a bike called Peloton, which is kind of new and making its way onto the, into the market scene. And I'm big mm-hmm. into that because it's low impact and it's such a great exercise and workout. But I just do stuff at the house because for two reasons, one, I endorsed a product by Beachbody called 10 Minute Trainer a couple of years back, and, and it did really well. It taught me that you don't have to go to a gym. You can do stuff as long as you stay with it in a everyday sort of schedule and just do a little bit. You can accomplish a lot. And the second thing is, is what I learned from that, my kids were young then, they would see me do it. And that is like monkey see, monkey do, and kids right. pick things up in, in a way. And if you sit around the house smoking and drinking and, and, you know, using choice words, the kids are going to pick up on that. And we don't have that in my house. It's more of a, it's more of a, let's talk about what we're eating and where it came from. And my oldest Kai is very good in the kitchen. He has got an amazing palate, much like his mother, just this really um, advanced flavor. He can, he can, he goes, Oh, there's a little bit of cinnamon in this or whatever. And I'm like, how did you find that? You know, but he can really search for flavors. Um, and they also um, are somewhat active, you know. They find time to go down and mess around, even if they're, you know, just playing around. And at least they're doing something physical. So that's where I, exactly. why I do what I do. And, and I don't do it for anybody else but myself. I'm selfish. That's very um, cool. But I have to have that little endorphin rush. Uh, and I do something almost every day, <laughs> you know. That's awesome. That's simple. And get this. Not only does he do it well, but he was named among the top 25 fittest men in America. Wow. And further, I wanted to talk about this. You're, you're one of the very few. You're the four-time participant in the Toyota um, Celebrity Race. I wanted to mention this because most people yeah. are not synonymous with your name in this race. So if you would, talk a bit about um, what draws you to that over and over and over again because that's a very big deal, I think. Oh yeah, it is. Actually, I thought it was five, but if you have four, that's four. But I believe it was five years I did it. But it's um, it's a pro celebrity race. It's for charity. But we get a chance to race. Um, and sadly, the race no longer exists. But it's pros and celebrities together racing right. side by side, right. and it has a um, you know, they we all get um you know, really well trained. We go to four days of racing school out in the desert. We understand how a car works. So I've gone through that racing school five times and it, it all raises money. Toyota donates a lot of money to children's hospital. Um, and right. having a chance to do it. And, and there were so many times I was like, I got to win it. One of these times I ended up by a pole position. Um, one time I was taken out of the race. Uh, Christopher McDonald put me into the wall. Um, 
there was another time where I took myself out of the, not out of the race, but just out of the running because I started racing in my mirrors, which anybody who races sure. knows what that is. Um, you're just paying attention to how close they are behind you and, and lost my spot. But I love doing it, and, and it is – I have a whole new respect for auto racing. I mean, it is such an art meets science world. There's the, the technology of a, of a car, like a Formula One, whatever it is, and then the art of just driving by the seat of your pants and knowing, you know, the different personalities and who you can come up on and how long you can take them into the corner before you start breaking and how you can psych them out and, you know, just stay on their tail. There's so much – into that it's such a it's such a great experience to have i'm sad that i'm that the race is toyota is no longer sponsoring it it costs them a lot of money to do that and insurance and things like that right. so um but yeah i love doing it thanks for asking about that because i think there's well, no 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 and, I'm, and i'm disappointed really too because i wanted to class. go to that yeah that's i mean it sounds yeah. like such a cool thing um and just so you know i got that right off your wikipedia it does say four times so just so you know. Oh, does it? Okay. I don't know if you well, do that. I'm yeah, it does. That That's up. why I was yeah. like, when you said five, yeah. I'm like, did I do this wrong? I'm like, you don't want to screw up and do your research wrong with Mark on the line. It's like, <laughs> seriously? You're like, well, be journalist. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> well, it's not, a, it's not a highly publicized thing, but I know, the reason I know that is um, there was a, there's only a few that have done it that many times. William Shatner was one of them, right. I believe. And he, um, Dean he blew one, up Bruce every Jenner car. One. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, I was up there, and that's why I was so disappointed. I'm like, how many times do I have to do this before I win this darn thing? But um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I didn't. I didn't quite get the checkered, but it's okay. It's all right. Oh my gosh! Listen to this. A little bit of a competitive thing we have here. Okay, and I wasn't going to ask this, but I am going to ask this because I know that commonly you get referred to as being the doppelganger for someone very infamous, meaning Tom Cruise. So I'm curious. <laughs> um, how do you feel about that? Because I don't see Tom Cruise in you. First of all, you're taller than him, I believe. Second of all, I don't know. They're just yeah. I don't know. I don't see it. But you're you. Do you see that? I mean, do you yeah. really embrace that? I, you're like that's awesome, or are you like what? No, I I don't see it. Um, other people, some people see it right away, and they're like they'll come up to me and be like, "My God, has anybody told you?" And uh-huh. I still get it to this day. Now, why it's been sort of instrumental in my life is it actually launched my career um, in television in front of the camera because I was working in Waterloo, Iowa as a cameraman at the 19, mm-hmm. and I was sent to cover the 1988 Republican National Convention in New Orleans, and I was just fresh out of college, and um, we were down there, and, you know, it, people, it was right about the time Cocktail came out, the movie mm-hmm. so people right. made the assumption that i was him and they wanted me to be you know because we were we would work and then i would go we would go out with a bunch of journalists and bar hop and people would be like oh can you flip bottles can you i'm like i'm not him no we know you really you just don't want to know so what happened the long story short is entertainment tonight heard about this um and they did a story and it aired that story actually if you look up um the video itself is on my Facebook page, on my fan page, the one, mm-hmm. not my private one, but, but the other. And it's in the video tab. And if you click on it, you'll see the actual story from Entertainment Tonight and, and the comparison. And when that story aired, I was a cameraman in Waterloo, Iowa. And um, it was weird because I think it was Mary Hart. I don't know if I included this last part on the end of it, but she said, you know, he's looking to become a sportscaster. And after mm-hmm. it aired, I had three... Um, job offers. I had a um, wow. job in South Carolina, Springfield, Missouri, and Bakersfield, California, all called and said, hey, are you interested? And I ended up picking the job in Springfield because it was closer to you know where I grew up in Dubuque. It was also in the same um, conference that I played at in Northern Iowa in the Gateway Conference, the mid- um, conference, con- depending on football wise, but we were in the gateway at that time. And I was, I could, could really relate to the teams. I knew the history and, um, it was a nine hour drive home if I wanted to go home and see my family. So that's really how it launched. Like back then there was no reality TV show today. For example, right. Patty, uh, Ali Fedotowski, who is on the bachelorette is co-hosting because mm-hmm. Debbie Metnopoulos, my regular co-host is off with her family for Greek Easter. She's sitting next to me because she was on the bachelor. You know, she won that. So 
right, um, right. her bachelorette. I mean, that was her that was her way of getting her job, her career started. And whether you were in Jersey Shore or whatever, all of these reality shows help these personalities sort of launch oh, I know. their career. Whereas you and I, we had to come up through the journalism mm-hmm. ranks and work in small market TV or, or whatever it's through the news division and hope that we would get some sort of exposure. Um, you bet. But that, that was, that was before reality TV. And because that happened, you know, everybody has to have a hook, you know, um, they want to go like, Ooh, what do we have? This is our new sports guy. He looks like Tom Cruise. And, and, mm-hmm. you know, maybe that's going to help us. So I ended up with a job in Springfield, Missouri. And less than three years later, I moved from Springfield to LA. Um, it was a big jump and it, you know, I soiled myself several times making that leap because it was from <laughs> a real relatively small market. And we went from right. market 82 to market two for those who follow the market size. It was, it's the second largest TV market in the country. And there's a lot mm-hmm. of pressure that came with it, but, um, you bet. but it was, it was that, 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 that doppelganger thing really, um, worked for me. And I finally, actually, I never was really sent out to interview Tom when I was, um, at entertainment tonight because we always sent really? the ladies out. Um, okay. yeah, the, the, the only time I really interviewed him was in a sit down was in Dubai for his final, it was one of my last big assignments. I got a couple other ones before I left ET. Um, I was in Dubai mm-hmm. and interviewed him for a mission impossible. The one where he's hanging off the side of the Burj Khalifa. Um, and, um, again, I think I put that picture up on my Facebook page as well. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, so you can see a side by side there where I'm like, well, we kind of don't, but we kind of do. And I don't I know. agree. You kind of do, know? but kind of don't. I, I agree with you. And I also agree with the hook thing. It's like, it's a lot of my friends are in reality TV and they constantly say, you know, it's launched us to doing all sorts of other things. And that's a great segue to my question. To those that are listening in, you attended the University of Northern Iowa in communications, radio, and TV. So there's a lot of talk about this. Yes. I'm a journalism major myself for here in UWM, but there are some that are out there that have really kind of pushed the limits in actually using life experience and becoming just phenomenal at what they do. So let's go back like 20 years ago to young Mark and say to yourself, um, is this the path you really wanted to take? Meaning if you could go back again, would you have delved off and maybe done something in another realm in entertainment, not necessarily being a journalist or an anchor, et cetera. Is there something, any regrets, anything that you haven't tried that you still want to try at this point? And are you also a proponent for people getting heavy on education to be able to further themselves in their career? Um, great question. So real quick, I, I never had a uh, ambition to be on camera. Um, I had two mentors, um, the main anchors in channel seven, Bill, I mean, um, uh, Liz Mathis and Ron Steele, who, who, and several others, they were like, I would go shoot their story. And they're like, now, you know, you're going to be in front of the camera. I'm like, no, 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 not me. Not interested. <laughs> and they're like, no, get up there. And they really encouraged me to step in from behind, behind the camera. And once I started going, it was more of my fear of failing that it was my drive to succeed to, mm. that kept me coming back going, okay, that sucked, so let's try it again and see if I can do this better. And I ended up growing, and then the doppelganger thing helped certainly um, move and advance my career forward because I was a hook. So I knew that I just didn't want to be, you know, with air quotes around this, a pretty face. I knew I wanted to bring more to it. So I, um, when I did move to Los Angeles, I became, I was a sportscaster and I really love sports, but um, I realized I didn't want to read scores for the rest of my life. So I started, I started studying Groundlings Improv, which is like second city for people who are familiar with that. Um, it's a, just an improv school, and I went through the first of four levels. The last two was a much bigger commitment. It was more for writing and for um, the actual theater stage performers. So it's like you okay. know, there's a lot of people from SNL and things like that that have been pulled from Groundlings. So I wasn't quite – I was still a sportscaster at that time. I was still working as a local anchor here in Los Angeles and doing this on the side. I then enrolled in a, a Meisner acting school, um, and oh, yeah. studied five years of acting. And I was going to pursue the acting side, kind of guessing, like, oh, maybe I want to do this, when Entertainment Tonight intercepted and came along and swept me up from my local TV job. 
And I was pulled in and ended up there for 17 years. Now, I hadn't really planned on that sort of career path. My way of thinking was, well, I studied acting. I studied um, improv. Let me do this. I've never really been on a movie set before, so maybe if I do this with E.T., I'll do it for a couple, three, four years. And I'll get a chance mm-hmm. to visit movie sets and make some connections, and then I can make the jump. And then, you know, and it was more of like a sure. let me snoop around. Well, I ended up being good enough that E.T. was like, uh, we're going to keep you for, you know, two decades. <laughs> so I stayed there. Now, the, back to your question, uh, to answer your question about um, advanced education, I just had this. Yeah. I literally, like 60 seconds before I called you, I dropped off my son at school. And we're we're going to be looking at colleges next year for him. And I we were talking, right. we were having a discussion. I said, you know, Kai, it's not, you should really know what you're interested in. And when you find that true passion, there are so there are so many resources to advance your education. They learned how to play a guitar off of YouTube. Like YouTube University is amazing because there's so many ways that if you have an appetite to learn, you can find mm-hmm. that material out there. If you want to be an electrician, right. you can find that material. You remember when we were in school, if we had to figure out like, oh, I got to go look something up, we had to drive to the library, get a, get into the card catalog, look through, then go to the you know, fourth floor of the library on the bookshelf down the hall on the right on the second tier and then go up and then look and go, oh, it's checked out. Let me go back to the card catalog. Now you just have to speak it into Siri and you can get an answer and figure it out. And someone's probably shot a video to show you how to do it. And right. <laughs> learning can go at such a fast pace as long as you remain curious and as long as you have a passion for what you want to learn. I don't think you need to – I don't advocate necessarily, oh, because we just talked about, oh, this friend of his turned on Harvard to go to Washington University because he was studying marine biology. And he's like, I can't believe he turned on Harvard. And I'm like, that doesn't matter. As long as, you, as you're getting an education, as long as you are still learning – and curious about the world that you want to be in. So yes, that's how I, that's how I would answer that question. Is like, just be very curious of, and have an insatiable appetite for insatiable appetite about what it is you want to learn. I taught myself ninety eight percent of what I know about photography. I've learned on online and right. through tutorials and taking workshops. So hmm. see, you see what I'm talking about here. There you go. And and I noticed that he mentioned the acting. <laughs> So in case you folks did not know, he was in The Young and the Restless. He was on CSI New York. He was in Nixon, of course, which I absolutely love that film. So I, forgive me for saying this, but I'm kind of bummed out that you just kind of don't take a bunch of your time and maybe be dedicated to doing a little more acting. I mean, is that even in the cards? Would you, I mean, do you even have time to think about something like that? Because I could totally see that um, happening. I'm to a point where I'm more interested in finding – opportunities to expand my career where I'm not working so much. For example, um, executive uh-huh. producing um, some series and things like that. We are since, you know, I work with this amazing company, Hallmark, um, you know, channel and, and Hallmark, the, 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 the entire family is, is such an amazing right. group. And so we're, uh, I have a wonderful team that I work with and we're pitching different series and things like that, that would either go on Hallmark movies and mysteries or Hallmark channel or Hallmark drama. I would rather kind of be behind the scenes doing it because to be quite honest, doing a two hour show live every day really takes up my time. And like you said, it's balancing that and that of being a parent. Right. That's so challenging, you know? So I think I, I, the acting part, sure, if there's a fun role or something going on that could be or, you know, something really interesting. But I think at this point I'm uh, I, I, I'm, I'm in front of a camera lens, it seems, more mm-hmm. than I care to be um, every I get day. It. It's like, I wow, do. it's all these cameras pointing at me. I get it. Now, I would like you to explain this because this is the photography side of him, folks. I was just... My jaw dropped when I saw this. You literally took 10,000 photos within a course of a 10-day span. I tried to break down how many words I could write in a day, and I'm like, yeah, that's not, I don't even know that I could, yeah, I suppose I could do 1,000 a day. That's a lot of photos, Mark. I'm like, wow, how, first of all, the wherewithal involved with doing that, which means you must have immense passion for what you do. But more importantly, most of us don't get this because we're not photographers, how do you capture the most creative part of anyone or anything? How do you learn to do that through a little tiny lens? Um, 
I think by being in front of that lens on a daily basis and know it doesn't, that that camera doesn't blink. You know, I come to work and I have, you know, the backstory of my life going on. All that has to take a back seat and I have to just be present. So, um, there's, if, it depends on, like, if you're shooting a headshot of somebody, you, you really have to find that moment where they are not guarded or showing you what they want to show you. Your job is to get them to be them. Um, you know, for example, you always take a picture and people say, say cheese, you know, and that's the worst thing you can have somebody do. Um, mm. That the, the series of 10,000 images came on a trip to Sierra Leone when I went and documented a medical right. mission. Um, my boy's pediatrician um, would always have me MC his fundraisers, and he would come back with pictures from a point-and-shoot camera that I was like, um, Dr. Bob, I think I can help you. Let's put a book together, you know. So we put a book together. We raised about $80,000 to help him in future trips and missions because everything is self-funded when he does these, and that right. was the goal of that trip. And we visited four uh, medical camps in that period of time, driving around Sierra Leone. Um, and it was, uh, we went everywhere from the, you know, the marketplace to these, you know, just traveling through the country. Everywhere I pointed my camera, there was a story. It was just unbelievable. And, and now, sadly, they can't go back to Sierra Leone because of how unsafe it is there right now. But um, yeah. having a chance to be there was so different. And, you know, it's just part of that. I'm kind of responsibility. I feel like I'm blessed in so many ways to give back and make a difference in somehow, some way, whatever. So we, 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 we did that and then shot a documentary to help launch the book as well and had a a a launch party. So, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that to me is how you really want, but I shoot everything. I shoot underwater photography. I shoot animal stuff. I shoot kids. I shoot babies. I shoot portraits. I just love, I love the process. That's so cool. And, of course, you did Norbert's Little Lessons for a Big Life, which is so cool because he was just talking about Norbert not so long ago. Um, now, you shot all of that. Is that correct? I just want to be sure you did all yeah, the that yeah, as well. Yeah, uh, probably 98% of them. There's a couple of, like, pictures when he was just a small, like, dog that's sure. in there um, that, that Julie took when, when he was a baby, but um, just a puppy. But, yeah, we, it was, it's an interesting, it's a fun little book. It's for grown-ups, but yet for kids as well. So um, it was fun shooting him, and I have. It's interesting shooting pets. There's all sorts of little tricks. It's like it's like a food <laughs> photographer, which I've done some as well. It's like there's a certain way you can shoot food, and there's certain ways you shoot, and it looks horrible. And you have to know the difference, and you have to know how lighting works with it. So it's a really shooting animals. You need to know the personality. You need to know, you know, don't overfeed them because they won't work, or if they're food motivated, or if they're not. It's it's uh, it could be a lot of fun. Oh, I imagine without a doubt, I could never do it. I can tell you right now, I don't even have, I don't even like my picture being taken. I've been trying to find ways to look thin and <laughs> in shape like some people we know. And yeah, I'm not working it really well. Uh, the red carpet's not my friend these days, just saying. Um, this is a fan uh, question because it goes without saying, you were on ET for over 17 years. You also did, you had, you were a host on VH1 amongst all over. The, I mean, he's just been all over the place, including being a three-time Emmy Award winning journalist. I have yet to get there, by the way, folks, just saying. And now you can see why I envy him so much in such a good way. So here's the question. The ones that stood out to me most that you've interviewed, um, so he's done Tom Hanks, he's done Jamie Lee Curtis, he's done Harrison Ford, Dolly Parton, Carol Burnett, James Brolin. He's interviewed Thor. Now, if you follow me, you know why that's significant. Why? Because in my head, he's my fantasy husband, even though he's married. And (laughs) you have interviewed my favorite celebrity of all time. Like, I have a list of five. You're one of them, by the way. Michael Madsen was one of them. Oh. I did him not so long ago. Oh. Cher. You've done Cher. Like, Cher is my number one yeah. ever. Like, I could die tomorrow if I interviewed Cher. So, um, yeah. what can you tell me about my girl? I'm like, oh, my God, I so have to ask this. So, you're in the presence of Cher. Like, what is that like? You know, it's funny you say that because she, when you asked, I was kind of sensing where this was going to go. There's a couple, that, but I, I always come back to her. I've not seen her in a couple of years, actually, but mm-hmm. um, Cher, this is how I, this is when people ask me what she's like. I always say she is the coolest chick I've ever met because she is, she is all that in a bag of chips. She is down to earth she's grounded she's contemporary she's not outdated she is um like i said trendy but but uh, a wicked sense of humor 
She's been around for so long. She sees every question coming, so you can't get one past her. So she's always – she challenges you. She's Julia Roberts is similar in nature where she won't let you off the hook. She'll be like, you know, really you're going to ask that question, you know? Um, yep. So she, she really yep. – um, uh, she's been in, she's been interviewed by everybody, you know, from Oprah mm-hmm. on down the line. So um, when you sit with her, you better bring it, you know. And I was just gonna uh, say, I just love her. I'm I the only one her. who hasn't sat with her yet. I I haven't had the the <laughs> opportunity to sit with her yet. We're we're working up there little by little. I'm just gonna keep begging, and giving her go. legs, limbs, all nine yards. That's so right. the, the fan question. The fan question was, out of all the celebrities over time that you have met, if you could tell us probably the top two that were most similar. You know how you walk in and you think to yourself, I'm going to interview XYZ person, and you see everything, the height, the whole nine yards, and everything that's out there. And when you met them, are there two that stand out that are literally just as you thought they would be, no matter what, good, bad, or otherwise, whatever, or right on key with what you thought them to be, not the TV hype per se? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I think the way I look at that in my head and decode it is who is comfortable to, to let their true self shine through because in Hollywood people have created, they've, they've stepped in the shoes of certain roles or whatever. And so now they think people see them as being that kind of person, whether it's like Keanu Reeves or whatever. Um, and, but they're not that person. So they don't want you to see that because they want you to continue to believe that they are the superhero that they are or whatnot, that the character that they play, um, you know, um, I would say just two that came off the top of my head. One, it was Julia Roberts. She is exactly the person I thought she would be, but the other is Sandy Bullock. Um, Sandra Bullock is so, uh, she, I just, I adore her. She has, there's, you know, like you just go, she's a mom. Oh yeah. She's also an actress, an amazing actress, you know, and Julie Roberts is the same right. thing. You know, like she's, she's a mom, but oh yeah, she is, she's an award-winning, you know, uh, actress. Uh, those two, I think are really close. What you see is what you get with them. That is and there's so, more. That is so ironic. Those are the two that pop in my head. <laughs> Yeah. And that's so ironic yeah. because I kid you not, the two people that I have been compared to uh, as far as my doppelganger would either be, and I think you've seen my picture once on Instagram maybe, um, Shania Twain was one of them, and Sandra Bullock is the number uh-huh. one. Most people say, oh, you look like her, and I'm like, have oh, you really? looked at her? She, oh, my God. She <laughs> runs me around the table. I mean, seriously, she's divine. Uh-huh. I would love to interview her, too, but I'd be like, oh, it's kind of like interviewing me. That's what people say all the time. They're like, that's, that's your girl, and I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. Um, so I have to ask the journalist yeah. question because who better to ask than you? We live in the world of 2018, and we're not in 1988 anymore. Yep. Journalism has changed. The world of, of media has changed, and things are so different now. So who better to ask than someone like yourself? Um, there's a lot of accusations out there about false media, et cetera, and, and obviously we see newspaper case, news publications shutting down. We see paper placement. Uh, the, a lot of the industry has changed. Um, so do you still have that that reverence and respect for the written word, meaning as it relates to doing journalism, have you had to, to reinvent yourself to kind of keep up with the time? Sadly, things are changing to where our medium isn't what it used to be anymore. But I'm just wondering to get, if we could get your take on that. Yeah. And, and do you still enjoy reporting things and still doing legitimately good stories? Are, they st- are there still tongues to be had out there, for, in your opinion? Well, there's there – Yes, there. I, I do have respect for for journalism or journalists and how they cover stories. Um, I think it's our responsibility as consumers who digest this stuff to continue to ask uh, ask questions of um, who is providing this information, what are their sources, um, has this information been vetted in any way whatsoever, um, just a variety of things and. And we so so we can no longer just swallow the pill. We have to sit down and ask right. ourselves. Now, let me bring it closer to home. So I work for Hallmark Channel. So Hallmark has a brand, right? So on right. our show, we had we just recently had Elizabeth Smart on, and she was talking about her book. Now Elizabeth mm-hmm. um, was for those who know the name but can't place the story. She was the 14 year old who was abducted from her bedroom in the middle of the night. Right by a man wielding a knife um, while her baby sister or little sister was in the same room. She was gone for nine months. They did horrible, horrible, mean things to her. 
um, that's not worth repeating, but she survived and she is married and she has children and she's a mother and she's wrote her now her second book. So when we sat down to do that interview, I mean, first of all, we're limited on time because we could have talked for two hours with her. But secondly, sure. we have a sort of a, a philosophy that when we are putting together our show and our interviews, that we want to have that Hallmark brand on it. We want people – we know that people are coming to our show to to buy our product, if you will, to, to watch our show, be entertained by it. They don't, they don't expect us to go down that dark, seedy path of – edgy stuff because we know that it right. could be moms with kids in the room. So we mm-hmm. change our approach and we look at it as two hours of sunshine every day. When you come and spend time with us, that is sort of mm-hmm. what we try to do constantly is put everything a positive spin. And that's why I love doing our shows because we try to find what's positive in the world and highlight that because there's enough negativity. So that is, would you say that's slanted or biased? It could be. You could put up that argument. Mm -hmm. It's just, however, the choices that we have made. Every journalist, when they write a story or they report on something, it goes through, you know, a perspective that they have or what, whether it's CNN or Fox, you know, everybody talks about, you know, the president gets his news off uh, his information from Fox News, you know, so whether Mm -hmm. that's true or not, Mm -hmm. you want to watch and see what's happening. And yeah, there is, there is fake news. It's happened. It's out there. So don't let, don't just take the headline and run with that and be like, Oh, did you see that story? Dig, dig, right. dig a little deeper and find out who's telling you. I tell my kids this. It's like when you get information, find out who's giving you, especially off the internet. My Lord, you know, are they really who they say they oh, are? God, yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. I agree. And it's an interesting dynamic that he happened to compare, talking about your show. In fact, I just was in New York City and I watched Harry Connick's show. I actually was there live and they did a taping. I'm so sorry that they canceled him because he has a show that's very similar to yours, meaning it's all about positivity. It's all about spending love in the world. It's all about having diverse and interesting guests. And he's an amazing host. I won't lie to you. I mean, he's an amazing musician. But the man himself is just an icon. I mean, I, I can't even say enough about him. Speaking of icons, Mark, 2012, you started the Hallmark Channel, which we've been talking about, Home and Family with Debbie. Um, give us a little bit of uh, summarization of what you guys do on the show for those that are listening and that actually haven't watched the show. I can't sure. believe it if you haven't because you should, and it's weekdays, of course. Tell oh. us a bit about the show. And then um, now do you guys do your tapings where people can come and see you? Because I know people are asking me, well, how do we meet Mark? And I'm like, you know, I don't know if the set, I'm guessing your set's not open, so people can't just randomly observe, can they, um, for taping? We, we do, yeah, we do. We do. You can you. Uh, I think if you go to our website, homeartchannel.com, and click on our home and family link, there's an audience okay. a participation or to sign up. So there's ways oh, nice. to do that and get, if you will, tickets to the show. Um, but um, uh, the show is a look. We we are a two hour lifestyle show. We we are just um, we just received an Emmy nomination. We'll find out on the 29th whether or not, or the 27th mm-hmm. whether or not we win that category. Um, if uh, it'll be our third Emmy nomination for this show in six years, which I'm right. very proud of, we have we um, our show basically takes your life and shows you how to live it better. Whether it's whether it's doing fun games with your kids or with your family, um, or if it's having um, financial advice or cooking, we do a lot of cooking on our show, and we're sometimes it's healthy version, sometimes it's not. Um, we have DIYs. We, we do something that, I know it may sound silly, but we do something related to Christmas several times a week because Christmas time nice. is huge for Hallmark. We're, we're coming up on Christmas in July, but we, right. we, we have Christmas corner and it's how you can make some cool little something now. So when the holiday comes, you don't have to be overstressed. We do everything right. from how you can plan to have a stress-free Christmas um, how you communicate with your children, how you get through all different sorts of, you know, family crisis situation. Um, and we have asked family members. We, we, we have a mailbox wall where people write in every day and we read the mail, you know, that we get. Um, and we also have a big pet initiative where we're trying to empty the shelters um, in, a, in this country because of all of the dogs that, and cats that need a home. It's really interesting to underscore this. I just want to take a quick second. We had a guest sure. on from Canada, um, and our our friends to the north 
have are very surprised and alarmed about how many shelters that we have in this country and how many animals do not have a home. You can go to Canada and go to one of their top shelters that they have up there in British Columbia. You might find four or five dogs, and that's it. Because they oh can't God. get they people adopt them so much, and there's strict rules on spay and neutering these animals that you must they must be um, you know that's their laws, and that's why they've kept their pet control their pet population under control. Um, there's so many animals that, that are euthanized every day in this country, and we need to stop it. We really do. So um, we do something at Hallmark to try to make a change with that, and um, mm-hmm. and it's every day awareness on our show and we're trying to adopt dogs we've, we've adopted out close to 600 dogs and cats so far um and uh, and i'm really proud of i'm really really proud of what hallmark has done and be, to be a part of that that's awesome that's a that's a huge accomplishment kudos to you guys on that that is awesome and then i found out that he does the tournament of rose parade tournament of roses parade with lisa givens i remember lisa givens and i love her too she's awesome i saw in 2017 you did that now is that going to be a reoccurring stint for you you're going to do the parade every year with her yeah yep yeah uh bob oh edwards gosh. uh stephanie stephanie edwards and bob eubanks had that had those chairs filled for almost four decades so um when they retired um I got a call asking, you know, would I be interested? And I'm like, are you kidding me? This is like the, this is the biggest, you know, chair to fill, first of all. And we're, we are seeing, um, I don't know if it's 400 million people worldwide watch. KTLA is the station that broadcasts it, but then it's syndicated. Nice. Hallmark Channel carries it. It's around the world. Yeah. It is a massive, massive audience. And Lisa is, um, you know, we have we have a common root uh, planted in Entertainment Tonight because she was there for many years, but we never right. worked together because well, right, right when I started, she was leaving to do her talk show, and we never really worked together. So we have a chance now, and mm-hmm. I have so much respect for her. I mean, she won Celebrity Apprentice, and she did it by being nice. Right. I mean, come on. Right. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Exactly. Yeah. Amen yeah. to that one, let me just say. And before yeah. I forget to mention, one of the other things that Mark is good at is actually there was a discussion that you had had, and I didn't realize this, how, how astute and intelligent you are in the regard of financial planning. In this industry, in fact, I talk a lot with football players, and that's one of the things that they work on is money management. People are just in awe of how much can be learned if you have someone teaching you the fundamentals of being proper and prim and smart when it comes to financial planning. I saw an article that you actually did, and you had talked about money management and financial skills, yeah. et cetera. So in this day and age, if you would, tell your audience what's the number one thing they should remember when it comes down to budgeting and planning as it relates to their finances. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, you know, um, save more than you spend, but um, I found out <laughs> early on that, that, um, you know, it's all about, gosh, this, this particular business, and you know, this, it's ups and downs and it is, you know, mm-hmm. a show could, you get a job to go away just because an audience yep. drops out. You may be really good at what you do, but that may not matter. So there's so much right. insecurity that it's always about trying to plan for the future and not outlive your means. Like just stay stay within a nice, humble space. And I try to do that. I don't, you know, we don't go on extravagant trips. We don't have, you know, my one expensive hobby is photography. Um, right. Outside of that, it's, taking care of my children. But I think really having, I, I'm smart enough to know that I'm not smart enough. If that makes sense. Um, I have, um, I have financial people that, that I work with that, you know, I'm like, what, here's a great question. If, if you're ever working with um, somebody and you don't, I always say this to my financial planner and I'm like, what am I forgetting now? What, what am I forgetting to ask you? And, then they're like, well, you know what you could ask is, you know, we should probably talk about this. And then pretty soon it's, they're asking the question you should be asking them. And I'm like, mm-hmm. makes me sound really smart. Makes me sound super smart, <laughs> you know? Um, all right. What are we forgetting? You know? Um, and then it gets them <laughs> to sort of like dig in their own brains and it doesn't reveal that you're not, you know, you have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> oh my gosh. Listen to him. He is. Oh my God. This is just too adorable. <laughs> well, 
Okay, I'm going to read off all the various ways that you can find this guy. And, and just, you know, I'll give you a minute to rest here because there's like 8,000 of them. I literally picked apart every oh. single one that I could find. Um, so here it goes. So Mark, in case you don't know his last name, it's Mark Steinus. I've been listening and watching that name forever and ever. Two places on Facebook. He has a personal page as well as a professional page. He has an Instagram and Twitter page. And, of course, obviously it's all with his name, which is Mark, and it's spelled S-T-E-I-N-E-S. The website itself, www.marksteinus.com, hallmarkchannel.com, norberthood.com, which is, of course, the book that we had preferenced before. <laughs> he is on Wikipedia, IMDb. Amazon, YouTube, Google Plus, LinkedIn, Pinterest. Oh my God! Did I forget anything? <laughs> I'm like, Whoa. no, I don't. I I'm, I'm a little scared. Oh, that I'm out there. I'm that accessible. <laughs> Well, you are, not only are you that accessible, but the thing is is that you're easy to research, of course. Um, I want to remind everybody that within two hours, of course, this show will be archived so people can listen to it for the rest of time. I don't want to forget to mention Hope Diamond. Hope Diamond is the reason that you and I actually, we're all part of a very big PR group, and she was singing your praises. And I saw this, and I was like, I'm on it instantaneously. And I'm about to tell you why. Because the, the last thing that I do on my show is, unlike your show maybe, I always surprise the guests. And then I get to tell you what I think of you, because it's not very often I'm guessing that you, Mark, get the oh. journalist to tell you what they think of you. So here are the surprises. Um, I am the founder of a New York City-based film festival. And if, if I beg you, and if by some chance you're in New York City in August, I was wondering if I could ask you to be a panelist uh, either on my writer panel or on my actor panel. I'd be very humbled if you would consider that. Oh, yeah. Sure. If I'm in New York, if I don't you're get in there New very York. often. But if, if you're in New York, York I'll I do was it. just going to say, but yeah. if you happen to get there, I totally get that. However, there is sure. an alternative to that because I am coming to LA, and if you, it, you probably have not heard my show. I tell people this all the time. I'm a New York girl in my heart, and I'm moving there in six years. Why? Because I'm afraid of LA. I'm not afraid to admit your city scares <laughs> me. I have to come to LA at the end of this month, and I'm scared because people scare me there. But. It just so happens that I am filming my film in L.A. I'm doing a day shoot in L.A. And so if you consider it, there is a role that's in there. That's why I asked the whole little acting thing because I'm like, if I beg and I plead to, to make him consider it, wait, at least think about yeah. it if I was in L.A. and I was filming it and he could be in it, maybe. Sure, sure, I'll look at it, sure. Yeah. Oh, you're awesome. That's wonderful. So those are sure. that's that's the surprise segment. Now the last part is um, the only part of my show that's not scripted. This is the part where I get to tell you what I think of you, and there's a reason I do it. Anybody oh. as a journalist, as you know, anyone can research and look things up and read through interviews and talk to other people, etc. These are my personal reflections. I won't lie. I, of course, ask your listening audience and, and other people about you just because I wanted to know what your fans thought of you so I could relay it to you because they don't have the good fortune to talk to you like I did. So here we go. These are my thoughts of you, Mark. Um, one of the number one reasons that I approached Hope about having you on my show is because there are very few people that I can think of in my writing world that have influenced me half as much as you. You may not realize this, but you influence thousands of people, not just myself. And it's not just what you've written or it's not just what you've reported on. It is the fact that in numerous interviews that I've read or I've seen, you keep very true to yourself and true to your word and true to your passions, whether it's photography, whether it's writing, whether it's your family, whether it's your program. You touch people because you are not something fabricated. You are true to who you are. That's a very, very big component to me in this world. I'm learning very quickly by being in entertainment that not everything is as it seems. Not everyone is as genuine as they seem. You are 150% the real deal, which is exciting. A very long time ago, I asked myself when I grew up and I became this big-time journalist, which I'm still getting there, and I'm in no way near where I want to be, and meaning your stature. However, what influenced me most about watching your material, whether it was on ET or otherwise, was the fact that you did your homework and you reported things and you did it in such a meticulous fashion. You're always so professional, you're always so poised, and you are always a representative of what a true journalist should look like. Today, again, I reiterate, we are losing that sense of things. So you give me hope and you give me faith that a real deal still exists. That's very important to me. Obviously, you're a friend to the camera. And why? Because you're charming. Everybody likes to watch you. Everybody 
everybody loves the show because oh. you bring a component to it that not everybody else does. More importantly, I love the fact that you're a hands-on dad. You're hands-on when it comes to your show. You actually respond to the little guy, meaning I thought for sure when I pitched you, I'm like, 64,000 people on my show, he's never going to want to come on. And you said yes. And I was so touched and I was so oh. glad. The reason... I wrote a film, and my entire film is all about the way people say the words, I love you. There is a sequence, and that's where you come in. There's a sequence in there where I look out into a room, and I had always wanted to win an Emmy or an Oscar. And I look out at the room, and I see people like yourself and other people that I have um, really respected through the years. And the one thing that I've learned is, is that I can become you in some manner, shape, or form. I can emulate the written word in such a way where it touches and inspires, educates, entertains, and motivates. You have done all of that for me. You have done all of that for millions of people out there that watch you all of the time. I respect you, and I admire you, and I thank you so much for your contributions. And I hope that if I can ever do anything to help you in the future, come back any time. I would really appreciate it. Oh, oh what That's a what wonderful <laughs> way to end a conversation. Well, I love what you think. I love what you think. Thank you. And I love it's the It's true. Idea. It's representative of, of a lot. That's such a great yeah, that's such a great idea. Well, Definitely. thank you for having me on. I mean, it's not about Anytime. the 64,000 or whatever. I mean, it's about the the one or two people that you you affect uh, their lives, uh, you know, every day. And, and if one – we always say that if one person, you know, his life right. has changed for the positive, then it's worth it. Mm-hmm. So thank you so Absolutely, much. Absolutely, without a doubt. Without a doubt. I will stay in touch. I'll send the pitch over to you. We'll see what you okay. think. And hopefully, cross your fingers, folks, will say yes. Have a great day. Good luck <laughs> today. I'll talk All right, to you, you soon. Too. Thank you Take so care. much. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Now I kind of feel like I was gushing a little bit, but I'm not going to lie. When you get a chance to talk to somebody that you have really respected over the years, I mean, what are you going to do? Again, my very deepest thanks to Hope Diamond of Hope Diamond PR. I cannot thank you enough for all of your uh, patience, all of your hard work, and all of your efforts as it relates to orchestrating this interview. I can't thank you enough, and it was really worth the wait, definitely, without a doubt. One more time, I want to remind everybody, he is on the following platforms, IMDb, Wikipedia, Amazon, YouTube, Google+, Plus, LinkedIn, Pinterest, um, the website's again, www.marksteines.com, and that's M-A-R-K-S-T-E-I-N-E-S.com, thehallmarkchannel.com, and of course the website for the book relative to Norbert is Norbert, and that's hood, H-O-O-D.com. He, of course, is on the Hallmark Channel. The name of the show is Home and Family. That can be seen weekdays, of course, as well. Go ahead and check out hallmarkchannel.com as it relates to the uh, different guests and all the various backgrounds as it relates to the show. And as we reiterate before he will be doing the Tournament of Roses Parade again with Lisa Gibbons for 2018 and do not forget to check out the books that we had talked about Norbert's Little Lessons for a Big Life as well as See the Light A Passage to Sierra Leone absolutely amazing interview thanks again to Mark Steinis for all of the um, all the time you gave us I really appreciate it so that's it for me folks as you might know I am headed off to Las Vegas to the NAB convention I will be covering that and flying back home on the 15th after that, I am coming back on, and I have shows the 16th, the 17th, the 18th, and the 19th. Talk about coming back with a bang. And don't forget the following week, exact same scenario. So please make sure that you tune in next week as it relates to that. If you get an opportunity, Greenville, Wisconsin, it will be on my Facebook page and my show page. Where to show up as it relates to we're showing our teaser trailer to us. Well, it's almost finished. It almost finished. Now I know I've talked too long. Almost finished teaser trailer. And that's going to be showing at the Spirit Fair, which is in Greendale, Wisconsin. I will have the location and the time. I believe it's 4.30 to 5.30 or 4.30 to 6. Go ahead and check it out on Sims Chat Corner page as well as my personal page. Do attend if you can. I myself am not getting back to fly back in time to do it. However, check out some of my castmates that will be there. So thanks so much to Ed and to Rebecca for doing this. Thanks so much to everybody that was listening in today and being patient with me as it relates to my show, my film, my festival. Thanks so much to all the support in general. You guys have a wonderful weekend, and I'll talk to you guys next week. Or, yeah, next week. Take care. Get excited, America, because Dunkin' Go-To's are here. Double deals on breakfast sandwiches made for go-getters. Why two sandwiches? Because sometimes your appetite is like your playlist. After one sandwich is over, you just want to hit next and enjoy another. So come into Dunkin' Donuts now and get two egg and cheese wake-up wrap sandwiches for $2, two egg and cheese English muffins for $3, or two bacon egg and cheese croissants for $5. America runs on Dunkin'. Participation may vary. Limited time offer. Restrictions apply. Get excited 
Solid America because Dunkin' Go-To's are here. Double deals on breakfast sandwiches made for go-getters. Why two sandwiches? Because sometimes your appetite is like your playlist. After one sandwich is over, you just want to hit next and enjoy another. So come into Dunkin' Donuts now and get two egg and cheese wake-up wrap sandwiches for $2, two egg and cheese English muffins for $3, or two bacon egg and cheese croissants for $5. America runs on Dunkin'. Participation may vary. Limited time offer. Restrictions apply.